Hello and welcome back, BC. This is Alexander with Wax and Wine. Uh, today I want to go over an insane haul I picked up at the local flea market. Uh, I don't frequently score so hard. I can generally leave with a couple records, two or three. Um, I'm pretty discriminating tastes now. I'm looking for very clean records, looking for uh, you know, a lot less classical than I did in the past. I think before I was just anxious to buy. That's how you fill up these giant record racks behind me so fast. So you just kind of grab all the records you see. I don't do that anymore. So uh, when I'm at the flea market, I generally hit the same vendors. I've been going there for give or take, let's call it six years. And uh, while I do that, I, I kind of know the vendors I can trust who always have good stuff, stuff that works for me and vendors who give good prices. The first vendor I go to always gives me a deal. They are absolutely insane, uh, frequently jazz and R&B, um, and they find some kind of odd stuff. Um, I scored hardest there in terms of a Discogs kind of vibe, but there was a vendor at the end of the day that had a couple totes, and uh, inside those two totes was a tremendous amount of fire. Let's call it that way. If I had done a flip through video like a Mr. Carlson or Bob Bradley, I think you guys would have been able to point out a lot of the stuff that I left behind. Um, I'm gonna get right into it. So I grabbed six records from her. Uh, I had never seen her before. She had tchotchkes, interesting stuff, antiques and some rugs. And then these two boxes, probably numbering about 150 records in total. Uh, there were no prices, so that's generally can be a red flag, can also be a good thing. But curiously enough, I got everything at an insanely low price. So the first record, a band that I'm only familiar with because of the hits, so it kind of scratches this one off the list. A record you're all going to be very familiar with, Raising Hell by Run DMC. So released in 1986, New York hip hop group. Raising Hell, this is their third LP. So it has my Adidas, but then for me being a basic hip hop fan, it has Tricky. And that's the song that I really want. And then of course, with an assist from Aerosmith, you have Walk This Way. So with that, I'm kind of done with my discography for Run DMC, unless you guys in the comments tell me there's another record I should check out by the, the super influential hip hop group. But again, Raised, uh, Raising Hell, 1986, awesome, awesome record. Uh, super fun, very nostalgic, and uh, paid 30 bucks for this. This was one of the more expensive records in the six record lot I took from the lady. All right, on to the next. Okay, so the thing that actually drew me to the two totes, because I frequently see lots of vendors at flea markets with kind of that assortment of like antique or Goodwill style records, and they're just trying to capitalize on the craze. I actually saw a bunch of ska in there and stuff that really kind of piqued my interest. Um, I took a chance on this next artist. It turns out that they're quite influential. I had a bunch of her other ska, so she had a bunch of specials and things like that, but uh, it was a cool assortment. So this record, Prince Buster, She Was a Rough Rider. So this is from, as it says, the Blue Beat years. Uh, Blue Beat was the original record label that put it out. This artist, Prince Buster, so I think his name is Cecil Bustamante Campbell, I was super influential in Jamaica and becomes wildly popular amongst the two-tone crowd. So I'm a big ska fan and uh, embarrassingly enough, I love third wave ska. Uh, that was my introduction. But yeah, of course I love the specials and Madness and English Bead and you know, all these other great groups that come out of uh, the UK. This guy, is very influential in the whole system. So this is a repress off Skank Records. Uh, I paid $10 for it. It is super clean, um, really, really easy music. You got Dreams to Remember, which is kind of a standout, which shows off his wonderful voice. Um, Prince Buster starts in the 60s, but has an incredibly long career. So he dies here in the United States, but started in Jamaica. Uh, emceeing and doing other things along those lines and uh, is rediscovered in the late 70s and early 80s by uh, UK artists and then that kind of helps get that second wave of ska going but influential all the way through uh, and then is touring all the way to his death let's call it late 2000 teens or so um, super super cool guy uh, didn't know anything about it uh, she had a bunch of Prince Buster stuff 
but she was a rough rider. If you are into reggae at all, I think you're gonna love this. So um, I'm a big fan. Of course, I instantly regret not buying more. I apologize for that glare, but uh, yeah, very happy. And again, 10 bucks, how could I pass that up? Okay, so this is where things start to get spicy. So in the collection where I'm picking up about these six records, and again, I'm not gonna go over everything. I picked up The Cure in original UK, Boys Don't Cry picked up uh, one other ska record, and then I picked up these next two. So I definitely made a couple mistakes on things I wasn't aware of, I'll, I'll be painfully clear. Um, but this next one, I had no idea. So she was keenly aware of how expensive this record was and how rare, someone helped her price it. So she told me that this record would be 200, but somehow I paid 35 for it. Uh, what am I talking about? Operation Ivy, the original. And this is Energy off Lookout Records. Boom, got them. Okay, so save for a little wild coloring here from an original owner, uh, this thing is cherry. Um, what is this record? It's a perfect marriage between punk and ska. Uh, influenced by, I don't know, The Clash, by uh, Two Tone, by all kinds of great stuff where to start with this great band because they have lots of great songs. I would start with Sound System. I would say there's a reason why that's pretty early in the order on the A side. Yeah, it, it brings the thunder. So that is a wildly amazing song. I would say there's uh, Unity is another really fun one. Uh, Bad Town, uh, Room Without a Window. There's, there's quite a few really, really great tracks on here. So they start in the 80s. Uh, out of Oakland. The reason why they kind of are still in the limelight is because Rancid is half the band. So two of these gentlemen, Tim Armstrong and Matt Freeman, go on to form Rancid out of Oakland, California. That must have been a crazy cool scene. Uh, you had Green Day out of there. You had a bunch of other really cool bands. So everyone thinks of Dookie as the first record. I was kind of astonished to learn that Lookout Records had actually put out their first LP. Maybe it was a combination EP. It's a very difficult record to find from Green Day. Um, but this is kind of a really cool scene going on. Again, this band totally works for me, even as I'm phasing out of punk. Uh, with that said, I just spun Dead Kennedys, and I thought that was, that holds up. Jello Biafra's wild delivery and those, uh, those crazy, great, smart lyrics, right? Soup is good food. Try to listen to that and think about AI at the same time. That'll scramble your brains a little bit. But uh, again, so paid 35, it is an original. I'm absolutely over the heels with this record. I do spin it kind of a lot, even though I'm in a heavy jazz mood. But uh, again, for you guys, energy, give it a listen, see what you think, and uh, on to the next. When I grabbed this record, I assumed it was a repress. I see represses all the time. I don't really care. It's about the music, right? Especially for jazz, I have to settle on represses all the time so that I can buy more music, not just buy one record and then not get to buy records again for the full month. Um, so I grabbed this, she put $10 on it and uh, over the moon, let's say. Neutral Milk Hotel in original from 1998 in an airplane over the sea. Holy moly. Uh, crazy good record. Um, so I would say, unfortunately for, for Mr. Mangum, he kind of had a tough time dealing with the success of this record. I think as a creative, it might have put him in a little bit of a hole where people just wanted to hear him talk about it and, and play it over and over. And I think people want to move on, you know. But what did he create? He kind of created, with the help of Robert Schneider and, and other members there, from like that Elephant Six Collective, they help create, this is gonna be controversial, like a new version of Oracle and an Odyssey, right? Like something like the zombies or like a Pet Sounds kind of vibe. Uh, subject matter, we are going way out there. We're very psychedelia focused on this like little family in Holland in uh, World War II. Um, but there's like vulnerability to the lyrics. There are uh, really interesting sounds, kind of a folky, eclectic, out there vibe. So King of the Carrot Flowers Part One, 
I mean, just the start of that, I won't rob anyone who hasn't heard it. Uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting way to get your footing on what you're about to hear. And it feels like we're entering into some other world, right? Um, in an airplane over the sea, your title track, awesome. Uh, Two-headed boy, all of it. Holland, 1945, right? So that would be a single from this record. Now, I came to this record after I was a little too young. I was just graduating high school in 2003, and around that time is when I discovered the the band, and this is the first album I hear. I get so wrapped up, I have to get on Avery Island, and then I hear about Jittery Joe's, live at Jittery Joe's, and that is really cool. To hear him in a little cafe setting with his interesting voice, having a conversation and talking about the little baby that's crying, it's all it's all very intimate in that. But this record, I think you could put this on for a lot of people and they would be way into it. I would say it's an intentional listen. You can definitely have it on in the background, but I think there's enough going on subject wise. It's It really grabs you. And then also just really cool songwriting. So amazing record, over the moon, 10 bucks. You gotta be kidding me. I feel like if you haven't heard it, you should just stop the video right now and give it a listen. Okay, so the next record is probably the most special of the haul. I, it's hard to actually top the Neutral Milk Hotel, just also for nostalgia purposes, and uh, that material just seems to always stick with me. So this next one is more for my budding love of jazz. I was just kind of over the moon when I picked this up and then saw what was in it after I left the vendor. Um, this is the first vendor of the day that I go to, and the guy frequently has a bunch of jazz that he'll he'll unbox. So he was toting a lot of Jackie McLean, and uh, it's an alto sax player. Um, I didn't really think anything of it. He had some 80s presses, some stuff like The Meeting, right? Him and Dexter Gordon together. And he had volume one and two, so I grabbed both. And uh, he had a few other things, and I saw an OJC in there, and I said, absolutely, I'm gonna take that. And the weird part was I didn't actually look at it. And I guess I kind of consider his stuff always to be in the same shape, uh, but it was a little bit of a surprise when I looked in. So for $5, one of four records I left with, I also got a Chico Hamilton album, McLean scene in OJC. So nothing too crazy to report. Also a little bit of wear and such. But what was this? This was actually a little bit of a Frankenstein uh, project here from whoever owned it before him. Uh, they put an original mono, pardon me, inside the jacket. Boom, original mono, deep groove. Okay, but enough of the record weenie stuff. What is it? So quartet and quintet settings from Jackie McLean the alto sax player, I believe from New Jersey, uh, 27 years old at the time of uh, the recording was released, or maybe at the time of recording. It's recorded between 56 and 57, and then released in 1959 on New Jazz. New Jazz is a subsidiary of Prestige. So therefore you're getting that whole roster of Prestige on this record. So you have Red Garland and Mal Waldron taking turns, right? So there's six tracks and it's an even split between the two pianists. You have two bassists taking turns. So you have Paul Chambers, tall, tall Paul Chambers, and uh, Art Phipps, who I was unfamiliar with, but plays and does well. Art Taylor is the guy who stays on all tracks. So he's your drummer. And then you have Bill Hardman popping in occasionally. So the opening song, Gone With The Wind, beautiful. I would say Old Folks is a fun song. Uh, you know, the little note by whomever wrote the back. I was talking about how it's kind of unusual for Jackie McLean, I, I guess because of the time, right? We were kind of more in a blistering hard bop kind of session. And I, I like when we take it slow. I like when the tempo drops down. It's kind of my favorite on piano jazz albums. Outburst, also a really cool song, a little bit of a squawker. So you're gonna see in the flex from the musicians. But I feel like it's just a great record. And overall to pick that up for $5 was a bit, it's a bit cuckoo. So it was an amazing day at the flea market. That is by no means a typical day for me to leave with original Operation Ivy and a rare one at that, uh, an original Neutral Milk Hotel, ay ay ay, uh, and then the McLean scene. So plays with a little bit of noise, I'll be honest, um, for five bucks, but it's pretty, pretty darn sweet if you ask me. And then the Prince Buster, the Run DMC, those are all 
all fun albums. So I wish all of you guys an equally successful dig out there. I think everyone should get one of those. It's a tremendous feeling. To your next time digging and to mine, on to the wine. Last video, I had mentioned skin contact, right? We were in reference to rosé as it's summertime. This is kind of an alternative to rosé in a fun way. And uh, it's definitely something that's taking the wine world by storm. So lots of producers are making orange wine or skin contact wine. Let me define it very quickly and then I'll kind of get into it. So skin contact is a very traditional way of making wines. When we make white wine, you're generally pressing the grapes and you get the juice out. Now the skins of the grape give you tannin, they give you color, they give you a lot of things that can provide texture to the wine. And uh, they'll be used in a limited degree in white wine. But again, traditionally, it was very common to just kind of leave it and let it do its thing. Now with technology, we know that we can kind of advance the techniques, we can do all kinds of things to manipulate it. So here it's more an homage to the past and then kind of just a fun way to be creative with white wine. There is a gamut of skin contact wines out there. Skin contact wines are also referred to as orange wines. There are no oranges in the winemaking. There is no citrus in the winemaking. So it's grapes. But then because of this skin contact and because of the fermentation, we start to pick up a lot more color. So what is a, generally a white grape becomes orangish in hue. So this is a producer I represent out of Sicily. This is Solerte by Vino Loria out of Sicily. So it's made by the grape Zabibo. Zabibo is a white grape. It is like akin to like uh, Muscat, very aromatic, very pretty. Um, and here it was aged on the skins to kind of leach all the color and you get into this kind of orangish hue. So again, no oranges harmed during the winemaking process. This is a more advanced, more intense category of wines or rather this example. There's another lighter version and it's probably where I'd recommend that you all start. And that would be here. So you don't necessarily have to have Baditsa, which is my other producer. Uh, so you see it says skin contact here. But what you'd be looking for is kind of a clearer wine. So you can see my face through there, magnifies the little mustache, woo! Um, anywho, uh, this is delicious, much easier start. Uh, I would say no matter where you are, if you're in California, if you're not, lean on your wine steward, ask somebody for a little assistance, because some of these wines can go all the way to like kombucha and they're just not good. And um, Frequently when you are in a camp like this, there's a lot of people who are faking their way through it. And then there's some producers that have been doing this for centuries, like those in uh, Georgia, right? So, and I, I don't mean the Southeast, I mean the Republic of Georgia. So just keep that in mind. Lean heavily on a steward, someone who can kind of help you, usher you in. I'd say $20 is gonna get you a great bottle. I think this is a great partner for a cheese board and charcuterie. It is an awesome spot to start, great for protein and for vegetables. Um, it really does its own thing. So again, what is it? It is a white wine made like a red wine and becomes more tannic, more intense in color and flavor and fullness. So you'll have white grapes like Sauvignon Blanc and they're aged on their skins and then they give you this whole other twist to what Sauvignon Blanc can be. So it's a very exciting category of wines, but it is fraught with um, real peril if you're not careful. So again, think 20 bucks should get you an awesome bottle, have it with pizza, like a white pizza would be rad. Um, or if you're doing like a little barbecue, it could be kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, skin contact, orange wines, they are all the rage go nuts, give one a shot so you're not left in the dark, so you see what it's about. And it's a great time to do it in the summertime because you kind of want a white wine with like a little more body during the summer, um, something that can be an extinguisher, but can also work with foods. So hope that helps. If you have questions, if you need any assistance, let me know in the comments. I'm happy to help you find something in your locale. And until next time, thank you again, Mr. Riley. Keep them spinning and sipping. Bye-bye.